Civil War have been avoided? Gosh, isn't that a question, huh? Every time I go to Vicksburg, I go to the Virginia battlefields, I go to the Western Theater, it always <coughs> comes up. There's almost like pitched battles over whether the Civil War could have been avoided, huh? So tonight we're going to get some information on that from Mr. Mark Tooley. He's going to examine how close we came just to doing that. And this is his third book, and it examines in detail this little-known last attempt to avoid the bloodshed that took the lives of nearly three-quarters of a million Americans and left other deep scars across American society. Uh, Mr. Tooley is president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy in Washington, D.C., which is a think tank organization that studies issues of religion and politics, where he's worked for 22 years. He's also editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. He's a graduate of Georgetown University. He previously worked for the Central Intelligence Agency and is both a lifelong Northern Virginian and Civil War buff. His articles on history, religion, and politics have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Detroit News, Newsweek, Weekly Standard, Washington Examiner, and other publications. Please give, give Mr. Tooley a hearty welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I have enjoyed attending many lectures here at the Lyceum over the years and had not imagined that I would be among your lecturers. Uh, at one point, uh, but here I am with great pleasure. Well, um, the story, of course, is about the uh, last major attempt to uh, avert the Civil War, and it's a story that uh, even most uh, history buffs uh, don't know about or know uh, very little about, and uh, t in a typical uh, history of the Civil War, it gets uh, maybe a few sentences, uh, maybe a few paragraphs, I think James McPherson's um, definitive uh, one-volume history of the Civil War uh, has uh, maybe a page and a half about it. Uh, the last book about the Washington Peace Conference uh, had been written in the late 1950s, and it's very uh, inaccessible and kind of hard to find, and uh, the scholarship of it is uh, still very good, and almost all uh, subsequent books uh, reference it as their primary source, but it's, uh, unless you're really into the topic, it's a little bit dry. Uh, and so when I happened to meet a, a publisher a few years ago, uh, he said, well, why don't you give me some ideas for a book? And just in the back of my head, I had uh, recalled there had been this um, uh, seemingly obscure event uh, right before the Civil War where they tried to avert what was about to happen, and uh, there wasn't really a recent book about it. So I suggested it uh, to him, uh, and he liked it and said, uh, we need a model of how people can talk through their issues and work for... Um, uh, compromise and uh, ne negotiate um, alternatives to conflict. Well, in fact, if you know the rest of the story, this is not a very good model of how to avoid conflict. Uh, there's not a happy ending, uh, but at least there was uh, the attempt to avoid uh, the bloodshed uh, that was to come. And of course, being a native of Washington, as many of you uh, over the years frequently walked by the Willard Hotel on the Pennsylvania Avenue side and seen uh, the large uh, sign at the front of the hotel, uh, signifying that as the location of the Washington Peace Conference. And typically, that's uh, all you, uh, you, you hear about the conference, the fact that it took place and that it was um, ultimately um, unsuccessful. But in fact, it turned out, as I delved into the research, to be a really a fascinating and a fun topic. And uh, my book uh, contrasts with the last book on this topic of almost 60 years ago, in that I turn it into kind of a, a social history and talk about the personalities who were there and uh, what was happening culturally, socially, and politically in Washington during that uh, February of 1861 as the country was literally coming apart and about to uh, implode into uh, a terrible uh, conflict. But uh, the Washington Peace Conference uh, involved, uh, at least theoretically on paper, 131 uh, delegates uh, from uh, most of the remaining states. In fact, uh, 21 of the states uh, participated. Uh, the West Coast uh, didn't have time to get their people there, obviously. Uh, the upper Midwest, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan uh, were um, at that time very, very uh, Republican and uh, suspicious of the Peace Conference motivations. Uh, many Republicans thought this was a Southern and Democratic plot to nullify or to work around the election of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, 
And so they were not there. And then obviously, those states of the South who had already seceded uh, were not there, about a half dozen uh, at that point. Uh, and so the Peace Conference involved uh, New England and uh, most of the Midwest and uh, the Upper South and uh, the border states. It came to be called almost from the beginning the Old Gentleman's Convention uh, because uh, the participants were disproportionately uh, older men uh, who had been in public life, many of them for many decades, uh, some of them dating back uh, 50 years or more, almost to the very beginning of the Republic. And so these are men uh, who had uh, worked together and known each other and been friends or enemies or frenemies uh, across the decades. And uh, one way or the other, we're dedicated to trying to preserve uh, the Republic. Uh, the research uh, was enjoyable because much of it could be done just sifting through the newspapers of the day, uh, which reported extensively on what was happening, uh, including uh, the, uh, the Alexandria Gazette, uh, of course, um, still our newspaper of um, our hometown here, which almost every day had some uh, coverage of what was happening across the river at the Washington Peace Conference. The idea for the conference, and many people uh, don't realize this, uh, came from uh, Virginia, and uh, specifically from uh, what was, who was then uh, Virginia's uh, senior and most respected uh, leader there in early 1861, and that was former President uh, John Tyler, uh, who had been in retirement from, for some uh, 16 years at that point, and uh, was uh, 71 years old and uh, living on his uh, beautiful plantation uh, near the James River, uh, Sherwood Forest, and uh, had literally, uh, was literally a son uh, of uh, the founders in that uh, his father had been uh, governor of Virginia back in the 1700s, had been friends with Patrick Henry and uh, presumably George Washington and other notables who helped to found our country. And so, and uh, Tyler himself was old enough to have known as a young man uh, James Madison and uh, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, almost certainly would have met George Washington, at least as a boy, little boy. And so he felt a great sense of duty and obligation to uh, step forward and to try to uh, save the country that he had served and his father had served. And so he wrote a letter to uh, a Richmond newspaper uh, suggesting that uh, the country, now being uh, in crisis since uh, Abraham Lincoln's election in November, and uh, the Deep South has now seceded. Uh, Texas is on the verge of seceding. Uh, Virginia has called a convention uh, to uh, discuss the topic of uh, secession. And uh, President Tyler suggests that before we move uh, any further, that there be a, a final get-together uh, to try to adjudicate uh, the issues uh, before the nation. He proposes that it be just the uh, as he deemed it, uh, the reasonable people in the middle. He wanted the Upper South and uh, the Lower Midwest and uh, the Mid-Atlantic states and the border states. He wanted the, the Deep South not there, not that there was any chance they would come, and he didn't want the, the New England uh, firebrand Republican states uh, to be there, uh, the abolitionist states. Uh, but uh, when his article was published, uh, the governor of Virginia and the legislature of Virginia uh, embraced it and uh, made it their own and issued an invitation for all the states uh, to come together in just a couple of weeks. It's amazing how fast um, events uh, unfolded, given how slower uh, transportation and communication was at that point, uh, to come together in Washington uh, for a conference starting on uh, February 4th. And so um, the states uh, sent their delegates, and they arrived on uh, the morning of uh, that uh, Monday morning, I believe it was, um, a snowy, chilly, uh, Washington, uh, slushy winter day. And uh, they met at the old Willard Hotel, uh, which uh, was replaced by the current hotel in the 1880s. And uh, specifically, they met on the um, uh, F Street side, uh, on the back of the Willard Hotel, uh, in what had been, until just literally the year before, uh, an old Presbyterian church that looked uh, sort of like the Lyceum, kind of a, a Greek columned look. And the hotel just purchased it for use as a conference and concert space. And so that's where the delegates uh, streamed in uh, late that morning. The uh, personalities uh, involved, uh, whom I describe at length, uh, depending on how uh, colorful and interesting uh, they were, uh, but the major personalities were, of course, um, John Tyler uh, himself, 
and uh, his young wife, uh, Julia, who's kind of a, a prominent uh, character uh, in my book, uh, in that she came to the Peace Conference, not attending the sessions, uh, but she did come to town and reported about it in letters uh, to her mother um, in New York. And uh, she had been, as First Lady, sort of the Jackie Kennedy of her day. She was, and I believe still is, in fact, I'm pretty certain she still is uh, the youngest woman to have ever been the First Lady of the United States. Uh, she was nearly 30 years younger than her husband. Uh, many of you who are hardcore history buffs know their story in that uh, John Tyler, uh, who was a widower when he was president and already had uh, a large number of uh, adult children, had uh, gone on a, um, a pleasure cruise down the Potomac on a, a U.S. warship called uh, the Princeton with much of official Washington on a weekend afternoon down to Mount Vernon and back. And... Um, the warship was um, uh, showcasing uh, their uh, new uh, artillery piece, their gun, which was called uh, the Peacemaker, as I recall, and perhaps ironically. And as the ship was uh, coming back from Mount Vernon, uh, the audience uh, uh, pleaded uh, that it be fired off one more time uh, for their entertainment. And it was, and uh, it exploded, and uh, the shrapnel um, spread across the, the deck and killed uh, several prominent Washingtonians, including uh, a New York uh, congressman whose daughter uh, was below deck. And uh, according to legend, uh, she um, fainted into the arms of the President of the United States, uh, who carried her off the ship and uh, married her some months later. Uh, <laughs> so that was uh, Julia Gardner uh, Tyler. Uh, she loved being First Lady. Uh, she was known for her uh, wardrobe. She had, as a young woman, uh, sort of been forced to leave New York because she had scandalized society for uh, posing in a newspaper ad for a women's clothing store, which proper young women were not supposed to do. Uh, and uh, as First Lady, uh, she was very regal and had kind of a, a dais uh, like this set up in the East Room of the White House where she, where she received uh, her guest. And so uh, naturally, she was uh, 16 years after having left office. She was very anxious to come back to Washington and to relive her glory days. Uh, so those are the Tylers. Uh, the most prominent uh, other person uh, who was there who would be recognizable to most of you was uh, Salmon Chase, who, of course, uh, was the prominent uh, Republican anti-slavery figure, former governor of Ohio, newly elected senator, failed presidential candidate. Uh, he had hoped it would be he, not Lincoln, who would have been the nominee uh, the previous year. And, of course, uh, Lincoln would go on to appoint him as uh, Secretary of Treasury, and he would be one of the great secretaries of Treasury in American history. But he was the most prominent Republican who was a delegate at the Washington Peace Conference. The other figures who were there were um, a big deal in their day, but most of them would not be recognizable even to well-informed people, historically well-informed people like yourselves. Uh, so there was a, um, a former uh, U.S. Attorney General there named uh, Ewing from Ohio, uh, an old uh, Whig, W-H-I-G, and uh, he's better known because um, his um, stepson, adopted stepson, who married his uh, biological daughter, was a, a middle-aged, uh, youngish uh, army officer who would soon go on to fame named uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, there's a former congressman there from Virginia who would be, was the most uh, fiery pro-slavery uh, figure and who would go on to become uh, Secretary of War for the Confederacy. Uh, James uh, Seddon, uh, who was said to have been uh, dwarfish, um, very, very thin, very pallid and white, almost looking like a corpse, and wore a skull cap on his head, uh, but had fiery black eyes like coal uh, that came alive when he uh, orated. And he was reputedly uh, the most uh, captivating um, uh, speaker at the peace convention. Uh, another figure who was there from uh, New Jersey uh, named uh, Stockton, had uh, been a, a senator, uh, but is better known as a, a Navy uh, captain and commodore and a longtime friend of the Tylers in that he had been captain of the USS Princeton on that uh, fateful day uh, when that uh, artillery piece had blown up and uh, killed uh, Julia Tyler's uh, father. Uh, there was a um, uh, former senator from uh, Connecticut uh, there named Roger Sherman Baldwin, you may recognize uh, the first two names of his three name uh, name uh, in that Roger Sherman, his grandfather, of course, was one of the founding fathers, uh, one of the few who participated in both the Declaration of Independence and uh, the Constitution. And uh, Roger Sherman Baldwin himself 
you may know a little bit about him because if you ever saw the movie uh, Amistad about uh, 20 years ago about the uh, Spanish slave ship uh, that um, the slaves revolted on their way to Cuba and uh, the sh they steered the ship inadvertently into American waters where it was uh, taken captive and that was one of the great legal issues of the day. Uh, are these um, s persons from Africa now slave or are they now free? And um, that went to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, about uh, 20 years before the Civil War. And uh, in the movie, uh, the uh, legal defense uh, for the uh, slaves in question uh, was uh, the senior counsel was uh, John Quincy Adams, the former president, uh, played by um, uh, the great English uh, actor, um, Anthony Hopkins, and uh, the junior counsel is Roger Sherman Baldwin, is Matthew McConaughey. So um, <laughs> when my book is turned into a movie, I'm hoping he can come back and uh, he can be Roger Sherman Baldwin one more time. Uh, there's a young um, Republican um, uh, politician uh, from uh, New England at the conference, and the, the younger men tended to be the Republicans, and the older men tended to be the older, more established parties. Uh, but this young man is named uh, Chittenden, and he's important to our story because um, we wouldn't know this story very well were it not for he, in that the delegates voted early on not to keep any um, official public journal and uh, barred reporters and observers uh, from their sessions at the Willard Hotel. And so uh, Chittenden took it upon himself um, to uh, keep his own uh, extensive journal and uh, he, like many others at the time, thought this was going to, be, going to be a very momentous gathering, perhaps on par historically with the Constitutional Convention of 1787. So he compared himself to James Madison, who of course was the famous journal keeper uh, of the Constitutional Convention, and uh, thought he would go down in history as the man who kept record of this event. Of course, very few people know who he is today, but fortunately he did keep an extensive journal, uh, and he announced what he was doing to the other delegates uh, uh, to which there were a number of protests. They did not want to be uh, on record. Uh, but John Tyler, who was very quickly elected uh, uh, the president of the convention, the presiding officer, uh, was uh, very uh, regal and dignified and proper in how he conducted himself. And he announced that, of course, uh, there was no control over what any of the individual delegates uh, would do. And uh, naturally, this young man had the ability to take notes um, if he so chose. A few other people who were there, Henry Clay's uh, son, who was a congressman from Kentucky, was there. Of course, Henry Clay had died uh, some years earlier. Unfortunately, he was known as the great uh, master compromiser. Who knows what he could have accomplished had he been there himself. Uh, there's a former Virginia senator there uh, named, uh, again, a largely forgotten figure, William Cabell Reeves uh, from the Charlottesville area, perhaps the most aristocratic uh, person in the room. He had been a senator uh, he had been ambassador to a number of uh, European um, capitals. And uh, it's uh, perhaps to understand uh, exactly who he was, uh, his um, daughter once recalled that her parents had very high standards who could be godparents uh, to their children. She said, for example, uh, her one brother has had as his godfather um, Robert E. Lee, and her other brother had as his, his godfather uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, and uh, her godmother was the Queen of France. So that was the, the kind of company that uh, the Reeves family uh, ran with. Well, since we're in Virginia, I'll just mention who the other Virginia delegates were. Uh, obscure people now, but uh, there was a lawyer from Lexington named John Brockenbro, who's uh, notable in that it would be uh, he, after the Civil War, who would invite um, uh, Robert E. Lee to come become a president of uh, Washington College, soon to be Washington Lee University. Uh, there was a congressman from uh, what would later become West Virginia named uh, George Summers, and um, he would uniquely uh, choose uh, against the Confederacy and uh, go with West Virginia in its secession from Virginia. Uh, and um, so that was, that was the Virginia delegation. Some of the other personalities who were in the story, even though they're not delegates, uh, but are still intricately involved, uh, there's President James Buchanan uh, himself, uh, the outgoing uh, lame duck president, uh, one of America's most uh, qualified presidents and considered one of its greatest failures uh, in that uh, he had been governor, senator, congressman, uh, successful lawyer, uh, ambassador, uh, had uh, excelled at everything he had done except uh, for uh, the presidency. Uh, but he desperately 
wanted the, the peace convention to uh, work. He and John Tyler had been sort of uh, frenemies over the decades, uh, and, uh, but they, their, the friendship part of their frenemy uh, relationship uh, goes into uh, active mode for the few weeks of the peace, of the peace conference. Uh, there's his, um, his first lady, his niece, being a bachelor, uh, Harriet Lane, a young woman, uh, very stylish, smart, who sort of kept Washington together socially almost till the end, even as it was falling apart uh, politically. Uh, there's uh, old General Winfield Scott, uh, the longtime commander of the army, uh, now uh, aged and uh, obese, and uh, not very mobile, but still uh, mentally sharp. And he, uh, as the crisis uh, has unfolded, he has just moved uh, the headquarters of the army from New York City uh, down to uh, Washington, D.C., specifically to um, uh, Row House on uh, 17th Street next to the, the Winder Building. And he sort of, uh, in this uh, power vacuum, uh, takes charge of uh, security uh, for the nation's capital uh, in preparation for uh, Lincoln's inauguration and for uh, other events uh, to come. Uh, there's Stephen Douglas, of course, the defeated Democratic presidential um, candidate um, who's in town. Uh, there's uh, William Seward, uh, who is uh, the senator from uh, New York, who is um, in, not a delegate, but in town and sort of uh, operating politically, keeping Lincoln involved. There's the outgoing uh, vice president, uh, John Breckinridge, who had himself run for president in 1860, uh, had been defeated uh, from Kentucky, and uh, ironically, uh, would reappear in Washington uh, three and a half years later as a Confederate general uh, attacking the city with uh, Jubal Early in the summer of uh, 1864. So uh, there are justifiably some suspicions about where his loyalties are at this point as a vice president. Uh, there's a, a Massachusetts congressman, Charles Francis Adams, uh, soon to be a min US minister to England, uh, better known as the, uh, the grandson of John Adams and the son of John Quincy Adams who would be a voice for uh, Massachusetts uh, participating in the Peace Conference. Uh, others uh, did not want to participate, but his views prevailed. Uh, there's Daniel Sickles, a New York congressman, uh, pro-union uh, Democrat, whom uh, many of you know from his various uh, scandals. You certainly know him as the uh, general uh, at Gettysburg who uh, lost his leg, and uh, his leg was, um, was and is on display at the US Army Medical Museum. I've yet to go see it. Uh, I think it's over in Maryland now. And he would visit his own leg for many decades. But uh, before he became a general, he was uh, notorious for his scandals, uh, one of the biggest of which had just been uh, two years before the peace conference uh, when he shot his wife's lover dead in Lafayette Square uh, in broad daylight. And um, his wife's lover was uh, Francis Scott Key's son the um, federal prosecutor of Washington, D.C. So obviously that was the big story of its day. And uh, Sickles uh, was acquitted based on a plea of temporary insanity, supposedly the first time that was used successfully in uh, uh, U.S. judicial history. And uh, his lawyer, very successful, was uh, Edwin Stanton, uh, who would be uh, Attorney General of the United States during the Peace Conference, and of course better known as, the, as Lincoln's uh, War Secretary for much of the Civil War. So all these personalities keep uh, coming together across um, the years. And then finally, someone I focus on in my book is uh, Phineas Gurley, uh, who is uh, the pastor of uh, New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, just two blocks away. Uh, but he had been the pastor of the Presbyterian Church that the Willett, that the Willett Hotel had purchased to turn into conference space and uh, would go on to be uh, best known as uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, pastor. Uh, during uh, the Civil War, but he would come back to open the conference uh, for prayer several times, as with many of the other prominent clergy um, of Washington, D.C. Well, besides the Peace Conference itself, there are several uh, exciting dramas going on in Washington that interrelate with the Peace Conference at the same time that I uh, discuss um, in my book. First of all, there's um, uh, President Buchanan and how he's handling uh, his departing uh, administration and um, he had had, he and his first lady would have a, a monthly um, levy, they called it, a reception for official Washington uh, throughout their administration. So they have uh, the last one uh, after the peace conference has begun, which is somewhat uh, awkward because many of his allies have, uh, Democratic allies have since quit to go with the departed states of the Confederacy. And the new Republican Congress is in town. His adversaries, but now uh, 
uh, uncomfortably friendly with him because he's, he's now the representative um, of the Union. Uh, but more notably, uh, he would invite all of the Peace Conference delegates to walk over from the World Hotel uh, for a separate reception uh, where he um, encouraged them to make the uh, compromises needed to uh, avert war and to uh, save the Union. And according to one witness, uh, was uh, at times in tears and uh, embracing the delegates physically and imploring them to do what needed to be done. Uh, he was regarded uh, with suspicion by many of the uh, Northerners who weren't quite confident of uh, where his loyalties really were, and uh, Southerners were not uh, overly uh, trustful of him as well. So he had the worst of both worlds in, in some senses. But uh, D.C. social life was uh, very active that February, despite the fact that so many Southern congressmen and others had to quit town as their states had uh, departed. And in particular, uh, Stephen Douglas, the senator and failed presidential candidate, uh, had at his house uh, near what is now Judiciary Square a, a party of uh, 400 people. It must have been a sizable house that the newspapers reported about and to which the peace delegates uh, were invited. And uh, Mrs. young Mrs. Tyler, and uh, <clears throat> even though she's now, um, she'd been uh, in her early 20s as first lady, now she's in her early 40s, but um, as Jefferson Davis's wife would later comment, she hadn't aged a day in 20 years. Uh, so um, if you see a photograph of her as first lady, uh, which I include in my book, she apparently looked the same 20 years later when she was in town for the peace conference. Uh, but she wrote a letter to her mother about this uh, wonderful party at Stephen Douglas's house and how all of Washington was embracing her husband as the hero and potential uh, savior of the country. And she was seeing all of her old friends and uh, being invited to dance by the handsomest men uh, at the party, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And she asked her mother to send down some dresses from New York uh, to attend such occasions. That's one perspective of this party. There's a much more uh, cynical letter uh, written by um, Henry Adams, uh, the son of Charles Francis, who would, of course, go on to become um, uh, a social critic and a historian of a sardonic nature, uh, who wrote a letter to his brother saying he had attended this uh, terrible a party at Stephen Douglas's house. Uh, Stephen Douglas well, himself was a drunk and a beast. Uh, his wife was pretty, uh, but not mentally all there. And that uh, John Tyler was an old fossil, and that it was pathetic how uh, all of Washington was swirling around him as though he were going to save their situation when there was no possibility the peace conference was going to accomplish anything. So two very different perspectives uh, on the same party. Um, so there's Washington social life. I discussed the Fort Sumter crisis, which obviously is unfolding, uh, whether President Buchanan should uh, um, resupply Fort Sumter. Uh, John Tyler had been dispatched not just to attend the, the peace conference, but also to represent uh, the governor of Virginia to implore Buchanan not to uh, send armaments or supplies to Fort Sumter, lest that provoke uh, the beginning of the war, as eventually it would um, under Lincoln. Uh, and then also uh, the Confederate government itself literally uh, launches the same day the peace conference begins on that uh, February uh, 4th. And uh, who pulls up uh, the new flag of the Confederacy over the State House in Montgomery, Alabama, but uh, John Tyler's uh, granddaughter. So uh, seemingly working at uh, cross purposes, uh, at least at this point. There's also the, uh, the drama of uh, Abraham Lincoln's journey to uh, Washington, DC as a president-elect soon to be inaugurated and uh, he would leave uh, Springfield, Virginia, Springfield, uh, Illinois, of course, and uh, give his uh, famous uh, uh, farewell, uh, saying, I know not uh, when or whether I shall ever return to be among you, my friends of so many years. Of course, he would never return. And then he would take a very slow, circuitous uh, train ride to the Midwest and uh, the Northeast, uh, speaking at various uh, public events, uh, trying to be uh, non-committal, being kept informed of the peace conference, but not wanting to be directly um, involved in it. Uh, there's the drama over the Electoral College. Typically, drama and Electoral College don't go together. Uh, that usually is a, a non-event when the, the Electoral College is uh, tabulated uh, by Congress uh, after the election and before the inauguration. But given uh, this dicey uh, national crisis, uh, Washington is um, rampant with rumors uh, that uh, the Electoral College vote uh, could be uh, politically disrupted. It could be even uh, physically disrupted. It could be violence uh, in the Capitol itself. And uh, of course, uh, Vice President Breckinridge, whose loyalties are under suspicion, 
will preside for that vote. And um, uh, it would take place literally during the peace conference. And uh, Winfield Scott, of course, is uh, very aware of these threats. And uh, one of the uh, peace conference delegates, in fact, uh, young Mr. Chittenden, the journal keeper, himself went over to uh, Winfield Scott's office on 17th Street and uh, found this very old man um, laid out on his uh, office couch uh, and uh, rose up uh, to his full uh, height of six foot four, still very imposing old white-haired man, and assured the young man uh, that he had personally talked to the Vice President of the United States and gotten a, a promise as a man of honor that the Electoral College vote would be conducted with propriety according to the Constitution. And he said, I trust the Vice President. And sure enough, uh, Breckenridge uh, did comport himself uh, honorably that day, but uh, Winfield Scott had surrounded the US Capitol with uh, troops and some artillery, and you had to have a pass to get in the Capitol that day, uh, which generally you did not have to do until after 9-11, for those of you who have been around DC for a long time. And uh, the peace delegates uh, themselves attend, sitting up in the uh, gallery of the House of Representatives, and there, there's whispering that armed men are standing by uh, to uh, intervene. Uh, but in fact, the vote takes place. Uh, Lincoln's election is uh, ratified. Uh, there are some shouts from the gallery, uh, objecting and uh, accusing Winfield Scott of having become the new military dictator of the United States with all this armed force. Uh, but it goes off without a hitch. And uh, young Mr. Chittenden, who is there, he seems to be everywhere, uh, reports that he takes a, a taxi, meaning a carriage, back to the Grilled Hotel that night. And he claims that the streets were just full of um, uh, rioters and uh, revelry and uh, people objecting to the, the Electoral College vote. Uh, no one else reports that kind of chaos. That, that may just have been his men memory from uh, later years. And then, of course, the final drama that takes place during the peace conference that I write about, again, not typically associated with drama, but it's the celebration of Washington's birthday uh, during the Washington Peace Conference that February. And it becomes a drama uh, because Congressman Sickles, the notorious Congressman Sickles, uh, makes a motion that uh, Washington's birthday be uh, celebrated this year with a special vigor. Obviously, he wants to wave the flag uh, for the purpose of uh, pro-union sentiment. And so uh, a, a large parade, is martial parade, is planned uh, on the streets of Washington. And people come in from the countryside to line the streets and uh, watch the parade. And old John Tyler uh, learns about this um, martial celebration apparently only the night before, sitting in his hotel down Pennsylvania Avenue called Brown's Hotel, near where um, uh, the museum is today, and sends an urgent note uh, to uh, President Buchanan, strongly objecting that this martial parade would be very intimidating to the Southern delegates at, at the peace conference. And so President Buchanan, being President Buchanan, is unnerved uh, by this communication, and that morning uh, cancels the parade suddenly, after everyone has already assembled. And so uh, the troops uh, march back to their respective barracks. The Marines, uh, the Navy, the Army, only the DC militia units have kind of a, a halfway parade. And Congressman Sickles is uh, so offended and outraged, he rushes to the White House to uh, object personally. And President Buchanan, being President Buchanan, is unnerved by this, uh, his objection and says the parade is back on. And so, <laughs> There is a, a second Washington's birthday parade that afternoon. Uh, th it's too late for the Marines because their barracks, as you know, is over in uh, southeast DC. Uh, but the Army is there, and the Navy is there, and they march um, literally outside the Willard Hotel, uh, by the north side of the White House, down 17th Street, and then uh, in front of the, uh, the south side of the White House with uh, President Buchanan and uh, presumably his cabinet and uh, General Scott and others uh, reviewing. So all of this, of course, is uh, mocked and reported in the nation's newspapers uh, the, next day, the next day, understandably. Well, in terms of what's going on in the peace conference um, itself, um, I'll spare you the intricate uh, details of their discussions. But basically, it breaks down along several lines. Uh, this uh, old Mr. Ewing, um, General Sherman, soon to be General Sherman's uh, uh, stepfather, sort of represents uh, the old um, institutional point of view that uh, yeah, I believe slavery is wrong, but um, it's none of our business what happens in the South. Uh, let's stay out. Uh, there's uh, Commodore, former Senator Stockton from New Jersey, 
who uh, makes, uh, shares the perspective that, that the election of 1860, the rise of the Republican Party and anti-slavery sentiment is a religious um, revolution fueled by a religious zeal that he compares to the rise of the Puritans in England in the 1600s. He says the country uh, will not uh, sustain it and that New Jersey itself would uh, quit the Union before uh, living under that kind of um, religious zeal and tyranny. There's a Democrat from uh, New York who uh, makes the point that Lincoln had won the election and won New York itself based on issues other than slavery, he claims, issues like the tariff. Uh, there's this Roger Sherman Baldwin from Connecticut, a strong anti-slavery voice uh, who uh, emphasizes that uh, the free states can no longer uh, accommodate and accede to the wishes of the slave states. They've done so for too long. Uh, there's the fiery uh, dwarfish uh, James Seddon from uh, Virginia who insists that slave owners um, have a right not only to keep their slaves, uh, to expand slavery wherever they choose for their own security, and to defend themselves against the North and the new dominant uh, Republican Party. Well, they form a committee uh, to uh, consider what proposals they're going to uh, discuss, uh, and that committee includes a delegate from uh, each one of the 21 participating states. And so that committee sort of goes into their special alcove to uh, deliberate. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Lincoln himself um, arrives um, at the Willard Hotel. And uh, you'll recall there had been um, uh, a lot of uh, rumors of an assassination plot against him uh, as he was um, coming through Baltimore uh, the day before. And so um, his schedule has changed at the last minute. He slips through Baltimore incognito uh, in the middle of the night and arrives at the Willard Hotel uh, early on a Saturday morning. And in fact, one of the Peace Conference delegates has to give up uh, his own room for Lincoln. That uh, didn't seem like very good planning in the part of uh, the hotel. Um, but uh, he gets his uh, suite upstairs. And um, meanwhile, the Peace delegates are uh, in session that Saturday. They keep an unusual schedule. They don't uh, convene until about noon. And they seem to stay in session until often until midnight. And this is February in Washington before electricity, so they're operating uh, by uh, uh, oil or gaslight uh, late into the evening. Uh, but for what, I guess they like to sleep late or whatever, uh, like to brunch late in the morning. Uh, but they're in session that Saturday, and uh, a rumor comes into the room, uh, or rather, um, there's a northern witness who is looking over the shoulder of James Seddon, and he sees uh, Seddon's, um, who has brought his uh, slave with him, to serve as his valet or manservant during the peace conference. And to my knowledge, this is the only enslaved person who's actually at uh, the peace conference. And so wouldn't it have been wonderful if there were some record of what his thoughts were as they discussed uh, his fate? Uh, but unfortunately, we have no such record. But uh, that slave was described uh, by witnesses uh, being among the, one of the most distinguished looking people in the room. Apparently, he was a, a very well-dressed person, a man. Uh, but he comes in and hands um, uh, his master, James Seddon, a note, which Seddon opens up, and uh, the northern witness is looking over his shoulder, and the note says, uh, Lincoln has arrived in the hotel, and Seddon uh, silently passes that note to another southern delegate uh, sitting at his side, who supposedly exclaimed, uh, Lincoln got through Baltimore? And so the implication was maybe he had some inside information about the plots against Lincoln, but it's likelier that everyone knew uh, Baltimore, which, whose nickname was Mobtown, was a place uh, notorious for political violence. And uh, there's was always some question uh, how they were going to react to uh, Abraham Lincoln's transit uh, through it. Anyway, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, the Peace Conference receives an, uh, an invitation from Lincoln himself that he would like to receive them at 9 o'clock that night, again, these late night hours. And uh, a few of the delegates uh, object, thinking it's presumptuous that he would invite them up to his suite upstairs. Why doesn't he come downstairs? Uh, but again, John Tyler, being the model of uh, decorum, uh, says, of course, we will go to greet uh, the president-elect at 9 o'clock tonight, uh, which they do. And uh, they're described by one witness as uh, proceeding up uh, like uh, animals into the ark, uh, two by two, uh, in a, a careful parade. Uh, others describe it as sort of like an amoeba, just kind of a mob of men uh, proceeding up in an unorganized fashion. Uh, but Salmon Chase, as a senior Republican, introduces each delegate uh, to Lincoln, one by one. And uh, Lincoln uh, shows he has this incredible political memory. He knew about a dozen of delegates from uh, his one term in Congress in the 1840s. He had served with them. The others, uh, very few of them he had personally met. But he, 
his political knowledge is such, he's able to re recite uh, some biographic information with each one. He tries to uh, joke with them, and uh, that sometimes goes well, and that sometimes uh, does not. But, um, for example, um, the very distinguished and dignified uh, Senator Reeves uh, from Virginia would write a letter to his son afterwards uh, that Lincoln has seemed very well-intentioned and um, obviously means well, uh, but likes to tell jokes and uh, stories and clearly had no idea of the, the seriousness of this situation, uh, which um, showed that, said, that uh, Reeves didn't know Lincoln very well. Lincoln obviously knew how serious the situation was, but that was just part of his political skill, that he would tell stories and jokes to charm people and put them at his ease. And uh, when he met uh, Reeves, uh, he exclaimed, oh, you're a, much, uh, smaller, you're a much smaller man than I had pictured you, but uh, no doubt very great in intellect. And uh, Reeves responded, well, uh, not as great as yours, uh, Mr. Lincoln. Uh, but apparently Lincoln liked to, uh, frequently when he met other men, he would like to um, have them line up with him uh, back to back so he could compare his great height to theirs and then make a joke how he was a foot taller or whatever, as he would have been with someone like uh, Senator Reeves. So if you were folksy, you enjoyed that encounter. If you were not folksy, you probably found that a little bit uh, irritating. Uh, but by and large, uh, the meeting is initially uh, cordial, uh, but quickly the uh, cordialities and pleasantries uh, uh, recede in place of more serious and confrontational conversation with uh, southern and border state uh, uh, peace delegates uh, confronting him <clears throat> on what he wants. Uh, if he uh, doesn't uh, support what they want, what is he looking to do? And uh, at first, um, he's vague, uh, but uh, as he gets his dander up, uh, he tells them, well, the only path forward is fidelity to the Constitution, and uh, that's what I will be sworn to uphold uh, as your president. Uh, so uh, as he proceeds in that line of conversation, uh, some of his uh, opposition um, is a little taken aback because they had been led to believe that he was a rather uh, simple, rustic, inexperienced man from the West, and it turns out he's a little bit more formidable than they had anticipated. And in fact, the Senator Reeves uh, supposedly remarked uh, that um, uh, he may not be as strong as a, um, uh, a Andrew Jackson or George Washington, uh, but clearly he has his own mind and will be his own man uh, in the White House. So there's some appreciation that perhaps he had been um, underestimated. Well, the next morning I reported my book, um, William Seward uh, walked down to the Willard Hotel and uh, escorted Lincoln up to uh, St. John's Episcopal Church at Lafayette Square. Uh, where nobody recognizes Lincoln. Remember, he had been clean-shaven, so all of his uh, campaign portraits uh, had a clean-shaven man, but now he has a beard. <clears throat> so he goes into St. John's Church, um, unrecognized, sits in the back with Seward, and it's only um, at the end of the service, when they meet uh, the, uh, the pastor, Reverend uh, Pym, uh, that he's introduced, and uh, people begin to talk, oh, that's Lincoln. And then, um, in fact, uh, it's reported in the next day by the Evening Star, for those of you who are old enough to remember the old Washington Star, it was around back then, <clears throat> and it said that <clears throat> people were taken aback by <clears throat> Lincoln's appearance, and the one woman reported that uh, he was much more handsome than she had been led to believe. Uh, Seward takes Lincoln uh, across the square to his own house at Lafayette Square for a Sunday lunch or brunch, and um, of course that's the same house where uh, Four years later, uh, Seward himself would be nearly uh, uh, slashed to death on the night of Lincoln's assassination. Uh, but who knew what was going to happen at that point? Uh, the next day, the peace delegates uh, reconvene, and finally they're, they're getting down to business, and uh, their special committee has reported their list of uh, compromises that ostensibly are going to save the Union and uh, prevent uh, civil war. And essentially, um, these constitutional amendments would institutionalize uh, slavery into the Constitution in perpetuity. So uh, they would uh, protect slavery where it exists in the Constitution. Thank you. They would allow slavery to expand into uh, the Southwest uh, Territory, so what's now Arizona, New Mexico, below the old Missouri Compromise Line of 1820. Uh, they would uh, allow DC, they would allow slavery to be abolished in DC, but only with permission from Maryland and Virginia as their neighbors. Uh, they would uh, constitutionally ban uh, 
the overseas, overseas uh, slave trade, which is already banned in legislation, but not by the Constitution. Uh, they would mandate more intense enforcement of um, fugitive slave laws, forcing free states to return escape, state, uh, escape slaves. They would require the federal government to reimburse slave owners for their escaped slaves if they're not returned. Uh, that would have been a major uh, new direction. Uh, they it would have required the North and South to agree on any new states. Uh, so there would be this constant balance between free states and slave states. And then finally, all of these amendments uh, could only be revoked or amended uh, by unanimous consent of all the states, which would be virtually impossible. So as I say, it would enshrine and institutionalize slavery in um, virtually in perpetuity. It's assumed uh, because uh, that the fix was already in, that the committee had agreed on this, representing all the states, it was just a uh, formality uh, to go through the vote. And so when they voted on uh, that Tuesday, uh, on these proposals, and they voted by state delegation, not by individual. Uh, they go through the various proposals, and they're passing, uh, but there's not a consensus. They're passing uh, with uh, seven or eight states voting against all of them. The whole point of this conference had been consensus. And then finally, when they get to the part about uh, allowing slavery to expand to the Southwest, and remember, Lincoln was elected in the platform of 1860, no expansion of slavery. We don't... Uh, we don't dispute that the federal government has the power to touch slavery where it already exists, uh, but we will not countenance the spread of slavery into um, Western territory. And so this is a direct challenge to the Republican platform of 1860. When they get to that one, uh, that fails by a couple of votes. And there's literally a hush, and then uh, the, the convention breaks into kind of an uproar. Everyone is shocked. Everything has collapsed all of a sudden. No one had been expecting this, seemingly. And so John Tyler gavels them immediately into um, adjournment. And you can imagine the World Hotel uh, that night, uh, ablaze and um, gas lighting and just a, a buzz, a beehive of activity and uh, lobbying with attempts to uh, uh, pressure and persuade and cajole a couple of states to shift back into favoring uh, these proposals. A Lincoln with meeting and some of the delegates may have taken place that night, it may have taken place the following night. It's unclear. The evidence is not completely clear, uh, but um, it's surmised, and it may be possible, uh, that Lincoln could have influenced the Illinois delegation to uh, shift and to vote for the proposals. And in fact, one of his allies uh, does shift, and the next day when they do the vote, this time they pass. And he's right, he later would write a, a note to Lincoln saying, I guess my political career is over. It wasn't. Uh, he would go on for many years. And the question is, did Lincoln facilitate the passage of these proposals? The evidence is not clear. Uh, Lincoln did not want, had no interest in these proposals, but he also did not uh, want to get the blame uh, for the failure of this peace conference. And he well knew uh, that even if these proposals passed here, they were virtually politically dead as soon as they left the Willard Hotel. So they were uh, harmless. So possibly he did give the green light, but we don't know for sure. And so uh, they have completed their work. Uh, John Tyler uh, thanks all the delegates uh, for their services. Uh, they thank the Willard brothers, the hotel owners, uh, for providing um, uh, free uh, meeting space and gas lighting at a co total cost of $735 uh, for the three weeks they were there. And uh, they disperse. Uh, the newspapers announced that all these delegates are going to march in Lincoln's inaugural parade in another week or so. Uh, in fact, they don't. Uh, and it's expected that John Tyler will personally take the legislation to Congress uh, to ensure or to work for its passage. In fact, he doesn't. Uh, instead, he uh, quickly quits Washington and rushes to uh, Richmond, Virginia, where the secession convention had been sort of on hold pending what was going to happen in Washington. And he uh, stands on um, the front steps of a hotel in downtown Richmond with James Seddon at his side and uh, denounces the Washington Peace Convention as, quote, unquote, a worthless affair and a complete waste of time. This was his idea, his project. He never gave any indication during the convention openly that he disapproved of what was happening. Uh, but he makes this dramatic shift. And clearly, although he had been quiet uh, uh, behind uh, the gavel as the presiding officer, uh, his mind has, must have been racing uh, and uh, turning against this uh, concept. And we have to assume that uh, 
he had been shocked as this old man in retirement for 16 years just how polarized the country had become. The country was not what it was in the 1840s. And from his perspective, uh, the northern states were not going to make the kind of compromises that they were willing to make uh, in earlier decades. And it must have been very shocking to him to hear the vehemence of uh, the anti-slavery voices and the new Republican voices um, in that context. Well, Congress, um, the Senate votes down the proposals three to one, not even seriously considered. Uh, they're brought up uh, in the House of Representatives, and um, they're essentially um, uh, mockingly dismissed. There is no vote. And um, Thaddeus Stevens, the abolitionist from Pennsylvania, uh, jokes out loud uh, that he agrees with John Tyler about these proposals, and that uh, people laugh, ha, 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 ha. And so that's the end of uh, the proposals coming from the Washington Peace Conference. And so you might wonder, well, um, did it have any significance uh, whatsoever? Wasn't it uh, a failure and barely a footnote in history? And uh, I, don't, I think it's much more than that. Uh, the senator from Kentucky at that time, known for his own compromise proposals, his name was uh, Crittenden, I think was accurate when he um, wrote a letter arguing that, no, the peace conference had been very important. In fact, um, the, the whole country was in this spiral and it slowed that process down, at least for about a month. And he said, as a result of that, uh, the, the, the succession of Virginia, the South's largest state, was delayed. That wouldn't happen until May. It helped keep the border states in, like his own K Kentucky. It helped to ensure that Lincoln got into Washington safely and would be inaugurated safely, as well as the Electoral College vote. And it allowed for pro-Union uh, sentiment in the northern states to coalesce. There were people at the peace conference from New Jersey, from Pennsylvania, who spec and even New York, speculating, well, if the union breaks up, uh, well, it won't just be the South. It'll be uh, states like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York. Uh, in fact, that would not be the case. The union uh, would uh, coalesce in the, in the North. And so we have at least to thank the peace conference uh, and the process behind it uh, for those accomplishments. As a postscript, uh, I discuss what happened to the Tylers uh, after the peace conference. It sort of symbolizes what happened to the old uh, uh, plantation south uh, very quickly uh, once the war uh, began. Uh, once the war began, um, John Tyler's mother-in-law up in New York uh, implored that her daughter come with, uh, and they had already had uh, a brood of children. In fact, uh, Mrs. Tyler had brought their youngest child, a baby, to the Washington Peace Conference. He was 71 years old. She was, uh, I believe, 41, and uh, they had uh, seven or eight children. And uh, the mother-in-law pleaded, come to New York for your own safety. And uh, John Tyler writes his mother-in-law, ha, 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 if you could see the fortifications we have in Virginia, you would know we're safer here in the James River than you are on Staten Island. Well, um, within a year, uh, Union forces uh, will have overrun uh, Sherwood Forest. Uh, the slaves uh, would have um, been freed, run off. Um, John Tyler himself uh, would die uh, waiting to take office in the new Confederate Congress. Uh, his wife had a dream before she at the plantation uh, that he would die. She rushed to Richmond to make sure he was okay. He laughed her off. He died several days later uh, at the same hotel where he gave this speech denouncing, denouncing the Washington Peace Conference. She would um, go to uh, New York to be with her mother at this point, well, uh, yes, when the, her plantation is overrun, she writes letters uh, to um, the Union Army and to President Lincoln himself complaining her slaves have run off, she wants them back. Uh, the slave women have taken her dresses, she wants those back. Uh, you can imagine how these letters were received. And then uh, finally, he, she employs uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Lincoln, imagine if your wife as First Lady uh, were left uh, alone in the world uh, as a widow, as I am now. Of course, ironically, she would be in less than four years. Uh, but there's no recorded response from Abraham Lincoln to Mrs. Tyler. Uh, she would uh, escape uh, by a uh, blockade runner and took uh, some bales of cotton with her, which she sold at great profit in, uh, I believe, Bermuda, and went to New York and uh, would spend uh, the rest of the war uh, with her mother and with her very pro-Union, pro-Lincoln brother for a very tense domestic situation at their house on Staten Island, which is still there uh, today. And when Lincoln was assassinated, uh, 
there were rumors in New York that uh, there was a Confederate flag on display in their house, and supposedly several men broke in to grab it, uh, but it was not there. Uh, but Mrs. Tyler was uh, resilient. She would uh, return to Washington, unlike other figures in the Confederacy. She, she still had money, uh, given that her family was from the North. In fact, other Confederate figures, like uh, Mrs. Jefferson Davis, would ask her for money while her husband was in prison, and she would send her dresses instead. She, apparently, she had lots of dresses. And, uh, she returned to Washington. Uh, she reestablished herself socially. She became friends with other first ladies, Mrs. Grant, Mrs. Hayes, and others. Uh, her daughter attended the, co the convent school at Georgetown, in Georgetown, the Catholic convent school. She herself would become Catholic at a, a mass at which the Bishop of Baltimore would preside. Her portrait was hung in the White House, and uh, she got a, um, uh, a pension uh, from Congress. Uh, I think. Um, they were voting legislation for a pension for Mrs. Lincoln. I think they felt obligated to give pensions to all the first ladies. So she was included in that package, even though her president, her late husband had become known as the traitor president for siding with the Confederacy uh, after the war. And then at the very end, she would move to uh, Richmond, uh, where she died. And uh, her son, of, one of her sons, would take over Sherwood Forest, lead it to recovery. And uh, as many of you know, it's owned today uh, by um, her grandson, uh, two of her grandsons are still alive uh, because, as you know, um, uh, they had children up to when John Tyler was still seven years old, and then one of his sons had children when he was in his 70s um, in the 1920s. So they have two grandsons still alive, well, I've heard not in very good health, but, um, but one of the grandsons and his wife still owns Sherwood Forest, uh, which you can visit, and if you Google or if you look on C-SPAN, um, Harrison Tyler and his wife have a uh, two wonderful interviews on there uh, talking about uh, his grandparents and uh, their lives at uh, Sherwood Forest. So that's the story and the epilogue of the Washington Peace Conference. I think it's uh, fascinating. Um, I hope you uh, take a look at my book and get uh, some more uh, of the details. And with that, uh, in fact, I have some copies of here, obviously. Uh, if you'd like to purchase one, uh, I'll be glad to sign it for you. And meanwhile, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be glad to receive those. Thank you. Yes, sir. How were the delegates chosen to attend the conference? How were the delegates uh, chosen? In some cases, uh, I think in most cases, the state legislature elected them. In other cases, uh, the governor appointed them depending on how much time was available. Yes, sir. By that time, the uh, Buchanan Secretary of War was a Kentuckian by the name of Joseph Holt. His attorney general was a man by the man you mentioned earlier, Edwin Stanton. Did either one of those have any role or any participation in the conference? Uh, to my knowledge, no. Obviously, they would have been uh, in town but I didn't come across any significant uh, references to them. Uh, obviously, um, the Attorney General had been brought in as a, a, a more pro-union replacement for his predecessor. Um, but other than that, I'm not aware of any direct role. Yes, sir? Uh, were the proceedings of the conference open to the public? Were there any newspaper correspondence there? No, as I mentioned, uh, the delegates didn't even want a journal kept. The reporters were barred. There were no observers. Uh, there were two Washington policemen uh, stationed outside Willard Hall uh, to keep anyone from coming in except for the delegates or their servants. Uh, and so, but there were, as I mentioned, there, were, there was lots of newspaper reporting all over the country. And uh, so you have to assume that reporters were in the lobby of the hotel uh, talking to delegates. Uh, so some of the information is good. And some of it, obviously, was just uh, made up or a lot of conjecturing. So for example, uh, there's one newspaper report saying um, midway through, the peace conference is collapsing. John and Julia Tyler are getting ready to uh, leave Washington. And, and um, there's, uh, this is amusing. She writes a letter um, to her mother. Oh, I have to leave Washington to get back to be with the children back at Sherwood Forest. And then a few days later, there's a newspaper account saying she'd been spotted uh, dancing at a dance at Brown's Hotel. Uh, she was the belle of the ball. 
So uh, again, she loved being in Washington and uh, was very reluctant to leave. Yes, sir. The points made for compromise seem to be all in the South's favor, as I remember them. Have I missed something? Was there an honest attempt to also make compromises that the Northerners or Republicans would have wanted? No, your analysis is basically correct. It was all, 90% of it is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, institutionalizing uh, slavery uh, into the Constitution uh, with the hope that uh, that would prevent more slave states like uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, all of which participate in the Peace Conference, that that would um, incentivize their remaining in the Union and maybe even uh, tempt uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, South Carolina, coming back into the Union at some point. But from the, from, uh, the only anti-slavery or non-pro-slavery element of the compromise was uh, banning the international slave trade constitutionally, that it was already banned legislatively, and allowing, Washington, allow, allowing slavery to be banned in Washington with permission from Virginia and Maryland. Other than that, it was all for the South's uh, advantage. But even that, of course, was not enough. Yes, sir. How do you recognize or reconcile in hypocrisy those who would say we have to uphold the Constitution and yet not recognize the fact that the Constitution upholds this legality of slavery? Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees to that. Lincoln agreed to it. Everybody suggests, hey, of course, slavery is part of the Constitution. And yet, they flip, flop, hypocrisy. Uh, well, uh, yes, Lincoln uh, openly said he, had, he claimed no power over the slavery where it already existed. So for him, uh, the great question was, would it be allowed to spread to the West? Uh, that's what he would supposedly not compromise on. Martin upheld the Constitution and then violated his oath of office six times in six months. Well, that's another book. I, didn't get <laughs> I don't get into that uh, time frame. There's one vignette I want to share because it relates to this story. Uh, this New Englander keeping the journal reports at one point um, he's watching the Virginia delegates who are in the front row at the same table and the Virginia delegates are, are forced to listen to an anti-slavery speech by a northern delegate and uh, he's psychoanalyzing them but he, he looks on the expressions on their faces and what he sees is not uh, anger he sees um, uh, mortification and pain and his psychoanalysis uh, is uh, these are men who are very distinguished, and uh, they style themselves you know, patriots and uh, Christians and great statesmen, and that it generally was uh, painful to have all of that um, questioned uh, by someone who is their political equal in this conference of uh, distinguished delegates from around the country, and that um, this would perhaps explain what would eventually happen uh, in that when you consider that uh, uh, if the South had stayed in the Union, um, Lincoln had no power to touch slavery where it existed. Uh, maybe he would have been one term, maybe two terms. Uh, they, the southern states and slavery perhaps could have outlasted him. Uh, but his psychoanalysis is or implies that uh, it was just a, a mortification and an assault upon their dignity. It was one thing to read about abolitionists in a newspaper far away, but to have some, to be confronted by someone as an equal uh, about your supposed moral failure and then to have to potentially live under a national government uh, whose policies imply that uh, you're a moral failure by upholding slavery, that was insufferable to him, insufferable to them. So that's a psychological explanation. Uh, perhaps there's something to it. Yes, sir. Did you run across any evidence of any foreign powers taking an interest in <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, but uh, it's kind of a crazy... Uh, Oh, Russia. <laughs> Maybe it's yet to come out, but uh, no Russian involvement. Uh, it's kind of a crazy episode where the young New Englander, the young note taker Chittenden, goes to a hotel in Baltimore and learns about a, a conspiracy to uh, subvert the government and the Constitution where there are some international involvements there, but I think it's just all talk. Lot, lots of. Uh, Lots of talk in Washington in that February of 1861, as there still is, but especially in February of 1861. Yes, sir. Was there not an extensive discussion of secession itself, given the history of the country to that point, New England in particular, 
having wanted to secede in 1812, effectively doing it without doing it, and uh, mid Atlantic know. states. And, I mean, I would have thought that would have been a major focus of the conference. I don't know what the well, their purpose is to prevent further secession and not so much to denounce secession in principle. But a northern delegate or several went to um, the conference to denounce secession as a principle, and the conference uh, refuses to do that. Was it like a minor point, though, as opposed to what you were stating? Uh, it wasn't a major point, but it was discussed, and their whole focus was this compromise package to lure the slave states back in. Yes, sir. Mark, with all the luminaries who did attend, um, unfortunately, Henry Clay had died, you know, four or five years earlier. Can you think of anybody who might have had an impact and might have been able to accomplish something who did not attend the conference? Um, you know, are there any other great orators or, or diplomatic forces in the country who, for one reason or another, didn't attend? And if they had, it might have made a little bit of a difference. Well, the honest answer is uh, Daniel Webster. So uh, the, the previous great compromises had been uh, organized with, by people and with people like uh, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, both of whom died in the 1850s. And so um, the people who were at this conference, uh, the old gentlemen, as they were called, are, are essentially uh, the, the generation between the founders and the new uh, rising generation of leadership in the Civil War. But they're the second tier. The first tier has already uh, passed away the greatest names. So these, these are the second tier. And it's these old men who think uh, they still have that magic to make the compromise work, uh, but they don't have the magic. And plus, of course, the country is so much more polarized than it had been uh, 10, 20, 30 years before. Anybody else? Yes? Can you separate the issues of slavery and states' rights, or are they inseparable? Well, uh, my book isn't offering a commentary. It's just uh, describing what happened in February of 1861. Uh, but in terms of what they discussed, it was um, slavery. But it was wrapped up in states' rights. But uh, reading the journal line by line, it's almost all slavery. So there are some people who will say that the tariff uh, played a role in uh, the lead-up to the Civil War. Uh, but a word search of the journal itself, uh, it's only mentioned twice uh, during the conference. So the, the focus is very, uh, it's a very focused conversation. Yes, sir. Sir, you come from a religious and historical uh, study group. What effect do you think religion had in making people so against the economic evil of slavery? Well, uh, I devote a chapter in the book to uh, the clergy who took part in the convention. It was opened every day by a prominent D.C. clergyman. Usually it was someone who uh, had also been chaplain of the Senate or chaplain of the House. And these were clergy who were friends with the delegates and were prominent players themselves. And I described their own views on slavery. Uh, I believe there were about uh, 10 clergy who participated, uh, roughly, and uh, several of whom were from the Deep South. But interestingly, all of them would remain in Washington during the war. All of them would, um, including the South Carolinian and the Georgian, would be, remain pro-Union and uh, would uh, become, were or would become anti-slavery. But I discussed the background in terms of uh, the church debates over slavery and how the great denominations had, uh, previous, had already divided over slavery. And uh, there's a, a quote from um, uh, the famous uh, senator from uh, South Carolina, John Calhoun, who said, uh, once the Methodists and the Baptists had divided, over, had divided in the 1840s, that was just a foreshadowing of the division of the country. If you couldn't keep the churches together, you weren't going to keep the country politically together. So I described some of that. Yes, sir. It's just a comment about the, uh, the young lady over there about the uh, states' rights and secession, I mean, and, yeah, uh, slavery. The fact was, there was nobody there from South Carolina, right? At no. The, well, the tariff really was an issue in South Carolina where 81% of the revenue coming through Charleston was being spent in the north. And then the rest of the south, including South Carolina, got the other 19%. There's nothing about slavery there. That's a state's right issue. But there was no one there from South Carolina to discuss it. 
Right, but uh, as an inducement to try to lure South Carolina back in, someone may have brought up the tariff as an issue meriting discussion, and it wasn't brought up in that context at all. So. I'm trying to illustrate the fact that there were other issues. They just weren't discussed because South Carolina wasn't there. Yes. Yes, sir. Did France, Francis Blair play any part? Uh, no, uh, not to my knowledge. Obviously, I think he would have been in town at that point. <laughs> Uh, but he's not directly involved in the peace conference, uh, and uh, he's from Missouri, uh, and Missouri has a delegation there, uh, but no one from the Blair family is on uh, that delegation, interestingly. Yes. As we know, uh, Lincoln, by reprovisioning Fort Sumter, provoked the shelling of Fort Sumter in the Civil War. Is, and uh, meanwhile, he's uh, praised as a great president, and Buchanan is often listed as the worst. My question to you is, is there anything that Buchanan could have done in that period prior to the inauguration of Lincoln to have averted Shelley or something, the, the, the pre pre and the provo provocation of the Civil War? I don't know. There is an incident where uh, Buchanan sends something to Sumter to which John Tyler objects. And uh, Buchanan is a little bit disingenuous in terms of, uh, oh, I didn't really order that. Um, but something is shipped through that he disavows. And you'll have to read the book to get the details. I'm not recalling all the details uh, right now. But uh, What's that? Floyd was Secretary of War. But so when did he leave? Was the whole the whole was already in place by at this point? Yeah, but it, the point is that it's been. I'm not sure when Floyd left. He left in December, I believe. And this is in February. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, the forces in Buchanan's cabinet are not, not much more um, adamant than now about not uh, compromising. And Buchanan himself would. Uh, I include a postscript about Buchanan. Uh, whatever you say about him, he did. Uh, he was admired for not criticizing Lincoln during the war and uh, being pro-Union. And when uh, Lee invaded Pennsylvania, he was urged to leave his Lancaster home, which he declined to do, uh, even though there had been many threats against him and against his life. He had been friends with uh, John Tyler, and uh, John Tyler's son had been one of his campaign managers in 1856. Uh, and uh, Buchanan offered to send him, uh, I believe, $1,000 after the war, because he knew they were Desti uh, near destitution, and which the son declined to do. So uh, even Bu uh, Buchanan had his, um, his good parts, I suppose. We shouldn't just dismiss him um, as a man. Uh, but he, as all of you know, he was adamant that he didn't have the constitutional authority to prevent secession. And so he is uh, perceived as being very passive during this time. But he did invest a lot of hope uh, in the Washington Peace Conference. I have to share this anecdote uh, again about the Tyler's uh, children and uh, grandchildren. One of the grandsons who has since deceased, but I remember reading a, uh, a newspaper interview with him uh, some years ago where he, he was joking that people often asked him if he remembered his, uh, his grandfather. Uh, of course he didn't, uh, but he said he knew his father and his father as, as a boy would tell stories about having been used as a courier between uh, John Tyler and James Buchanan. So when um, Tyler came to DC, they brought their baby and they brought at least one, not two of their little sons. And one of them was used as a, a courier back between Brown's Hotel and uh, the White House. So again, when the movie is made, that'll be, that'll be part of the story. Thank you. Thank you very much.